I mentioned too last week uh, that we're well underway in implementing the provisions of the 2019 NDA on the 5G clean path. I raised this issue again of clean path so that Americans know that just as the Trump administration has taken unprecedented action to defend our physical borders, so too are we defending America on cyber frontiers. Simply put, in upcoming 5G networks, mobile data traffic entering American diplomatic systems will be subject to new, stringent requirements if it has transited Huawei equipment. The objective is that untrusted IT vendors will have no access to U.S. State Department systems. We'll follow the letter of the law to ensure that we have a clean path for all 5G network traffic coming into all of our facilities, period. We will keep doing all we can to keep our critical data and our network safe from the Chinese Communist Party. Finally, before I take a handful of questions and update on our health and humanitarian aid uh, to assist in countries who are working to fight the virus in their nation, our team recently crushed, crushed some, uh, some data from the Kaiser Family Foundation and a philanthropy called Candid. They found that Americans have devoted nearly $6.5 billion in government and non-government contributions to help countries fight COVID-19. $6.5 billion. This is by far the largest country total in the world and more than 12 times that of China's combined contributions. I'm especially proud of the work that we've done in the Indo-Pacific region. The United States government has provided more than $32 million in funding to support the COVID-19 response in Pacific Island countries. We're working with the Burmese government, United Nations, NGOs, and others to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Burma, including among vulnerable populations. And we're working with our friends in Australia, in India, in Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, and Vietnam to share information and best practices as we begin to move the global economy forward. Our conversations certainly involve global supply chains, keeping them running smoothly, and getting our economies back to full strength thinking about how we restructure these supply chains to prevent something like this from ever happening again. Uh, one example of our work together is with India. It's lifted export bans on critical medical supplies, including pharmaceuticals used to treat some COVID-19 patients. And a few days ago, I spoke with David Beasley uh, of the World Food Bank. Uh, he's its executive director. Uh, he reminded me that the American people in their unmatched generosity supply 42% of the World Food Programs annual resources, which feed nearly 100 million people around the world. We'll continue to help meet the world's food needs as the COVID-19 outbreak disrupts global supply chains around the world. Uh, one message I want to make sure and repeat today. If you're wrongfully detaining Americans during this time and they become infected and die of coronavirus, we will hold your government strictly responsible. All wrongfully detained Americans should be released immediately. Morgan, now happy to take a few questions. Go ahead, Christine. Mr. Secretary. Hi. Um, speaking of that foreign policy mission, uh, yes. North Korea, uh, I'd like to ask you what you know about Kim Jong Un's health, but I don't think we'll get much out of you there. So, um, so you're going like, to something different. Unless yes. you'd like to prove me wrong. Um, well, happy to take whatever you know. Um, but I, I'd like to ask you, as somebody who has a lot of knowledge of both the leader and the country, North Korea, I'm wondering if you think North Korea would be safer or more dangerous with without Kim Jong Un in charge. And I'm also wondering, is the U.S. making plans for what would happen if he dies or is no longer in place as the president of that country? Thank yeah. you. So I don't have anything to add uh, to the status of Chairman Kim. I think the president commented on it yesterday. Uh, you know, we did have a chance to interact with a number of North Koreans on our various trips, the ones that I took uh, along with my team, and then when the president traveled there for, uh, to meet with Chairman Kim and his team as well. So we've had a chance to meet uh, Chairman Kim's sister and some of the other leaders there as well. Um, our, our mission is the same, regardless of what transpires inside of North Korea with respect to their leadership. Our mission remains the same, is to deliver on the agreement that Chairman Kim made with President Trump back in Singapore, and that's the fully denuclearized, verified denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, we are still hopeful that we'll find a path uh, to negotiate that solution to get the outcome that good for the American people, good for the North Korean people, and the whole world. Uh, our mission simply won't change, no matter what should transpire there. But does that mission get harder if he's no longer there? Well, there's a, there's a lot of work to do on it. We're going to continue to focus on it. Thank you.
Yes, Francesco. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you on Iran. Uh, you're asking the UN Security Council to renew the arms embargo on Iran. Um, can the US make the argument that it is still a state participant to the in the JCPOA after it scratched it uh, in 2018? And do you think this can work? And if I can add one on um, the COVID-19 crisis, um, as governments and states uh, are reopening or start planning reopening their economies, um, do you see a prospect or a date for lifting the, the travel bans and reopening the borders as well? Uh, I remember when uh, the president announced the travel ban from Europe, he said for 30 days, and it, this was mid-March. Do yeah. you see anything on this? Yeah. Uh, so let me take the second question first. We're starting as part of the process that the vice president's team is leading uh, to think not only there's a lot of talk about how America is going to reopen, how states will do it, our particular parts of the state's going to reopen as they become safe, as we uh, develop operational theories about how to make sure we get the economy going while we protect our citizens from the virus. We're doing the same thing with our partners around the world, State Department, DHS, Department of Transportation, or working on the elements that will be required to get international air travel back going, not only to get the flights back in place, but to do so in a way that will give confidence to those who want to travel that they can do so and do so safely. And we're, um, we've made quite a bit of progress in thinking about how to do that. And as for when we will, State Department will reconsider its travel warnings, we'll, we'll do what we always do. We apply the same rubric, the same systems to evaluate how our travel warnings should go in place. And those are, um, those are connected to how we'll think about a reopening travel to these places, how the government limitations will be put in place. So we have, there are two pieces of this. There's a DHS piece and State Department piece, as well as the travel bans. And we are working to work with countries all around the world to not only make sure that uh, we lift those bans, that we create the conditions where people will travel, that business will go there, that people who want to go see uh, beautiful beaches and travel on vacation or take mission trips around the world will be able to do so. And we hope that we can get those back open as each country is ready to do that, and as we're confident that people who travel in from those countries won't create tremendous increased risk to the United States as well. Before the summer? Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll let the Vice President talk about elements of that. I, I, we're going to do it as fast as we, quick, as we can and do so safely. Uh, your first question was about uh, uh, Iran's uh, ability to purchase conventional weapon systems starting on October 23rd of this year in the absence of action. Uh, we're not going to let that happen. Uh, the, the failures of the Iran nuclear deal are legion. One of them is now upon us. It's now just several months out where China, Russia, other countries from around the world can all sell significant conventional weapon systems to the Iranians in October of this year. This isn't far off. This isn't some fantasy by, the, by conservatives. This is a reality. Does anybody think that the nation that today is conducting terror campaigns by Lebanese Hezbollah or Iraqi Shia movements or firing military missiles into the air ought to be permitted to purchase conventional weapon systems in just a few months? Uh, I think the world realizes that's a mistake. We're urging our E3 partners to take action, which is within their capacity to do. We'll, go to the, we'll work with the UN Security Council to extend that prohibition on those arms sales. Uh, and then in the event we can't get anyone else to act, the United States is evaluating every possibility about how we might do that. And I'm not trying to be too clever by half. Your question was about uh, us as a participant. The UN Security Council Resolution 2231 is very clear. We don't have to, we don't have to declare ourselves a participant. <laughs> UN Security Council Resolution 2231 is unambiguous. Where the United States is a participant in the in the UN security, it's just there in the language. There's nothing magic about this. There's no fancy. I, someone suggested this is fancy lawyering. It's just reading. Uh, it, it, it's it's unambiguous, and the rights that accrue to uh, participants under UN Security Council resolution are fully available to all those participants. And we're gonna we are gonna make sure that come October of this year, the Iranians aren't able to buy conventional weapons. Uh, that they would be, uh, sub given what uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden uh, delivered to the world in that terrible deal. Nick. Secretary, thank you very much for, for doing this. A uh, question about uh, China and um, let's see the WHO. Uh, so on China, um, <clears throat> we've heard a, a similar talking point, as you know, from CGTN to the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs podium that the U.S. Uh, had months of warning that it squandered. Uh, we noticed a new tweet 
uh, from MOFA that suggests the U.S. is engaged in a conspiracy. So could you tell us, is the rhetorical ceasefire, as we've been talking about, uh, that the president declared over? Uh, and on WHO, um, you've been criticized uh, on the freeze. Uh, number two funder of WHO, Bill Gates, has criticized it. China, as you know, has inserted more money. WHO does things that no one else does uh, around the world, as you know, measles campaigns, for example. Are you concerned at all that the freeze will reduce influence over the WHO and reduce your ability to conduct the reforms that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. So your, your first question, uh, what we do is speak the truth about risk to the American people. Our mission set at the State Department is to protect the American people from threats around the world. So the information we provide about where this virus began in Wuhan is just data. Uh, you, you, you suggested that the MF, Chinese MFA and CGTN and other Chinese media outlets are saying the same thing. I'll leave it at that. Uh, su suffice it to say is that when countries engage in disinformation, it creates risk. We, the, the Chinese Communist Party tells us they want to be our partners, they want to be transparent. We need partners we can rely on that when they tell us something, it is accurate and that we don't think they're hiding anything. Look, we still haven't gained access, the world hasn't gained access to the WIV, the Virology Institute there. We, we don't know precisely where this virus originated from. There are multiple labs that are continuing to conduct work, we think, on contagious pathogens inside of China today, and we don't know if they are operating at a level of security to prevent this from happening again. Remember, this isn't the first time that we've had a virus come out of China. And so there is a continuing obligation on the part of reliable partners to share this information with the world. We talk, we talk about this in the context of nuclear assurance all the time, where countries permit others to come in and see their systems to make sure that the locks and keys are right, that the security levels are right, that the technological capability is right, that the checks are right so that you can prevent an accidental uh, nuclear release, we need the same kinds of processes for biosystems and bio laboratories as well. And so we would, we would urge every country, all of our partners, to demand that we get answers for what happened here, but also that we continue to have, we get the transparency, that the world gets the transparency. It needs to make sure that those who are conducting scientific research on complex viruses and pathogens are doing so in a way that doesn't create the risk that we get precisely the economic devastation and the enormous loss of life that we've all suffered as a result of this virus that came out of Wuhan, China. And the WHO? WHO, so, WHO we're, we're going to get this right. Uh, we're the biggest contributor to the World Health Organization. It failed in its mission here, and so we're conducting a review to figure out how best to use American taxpayer money to deliver real outcomes. Uh, Trump administration has been clear. I've given speeches about this. We engage in multilateral work all across the world. We're doing so even this morning. I was on the phone talking about our work with countries around the world on Venezuela. We built out a defeat ISIS coalition of 90 plus countries. We're happy to work with countries around the world to deliver real outcomes that deliver security for the American people. Uh, we, we shouldn't pretend that because some organization has health in its title that it's actually capable of delivering the outcomes that we need. Uh, I think about this in the context of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. It's a politicized organization, not a court. We want to make sure that we're getting it right so that we can deliver outcomes for the American people. And the same holds true here. We'll conduct our review. We'll evaluate this. If there is a function that only the WHO can do, and we think it is important for American national security because we are good humanitarian partners around the world, I'm confident we'll find a way to deliver that outcome. So I just urge everyone, people, there's private donors who contribute to the WHO, always ask, is this the best model? Is this really the right outcome? When you see the influence that the Chinese Communist Party had as they were debating how to handle this virus in January of this year, and when you think about those things and the risks that those pose to the world, we, it is an obligation to reconsider whether that vehicle is the right one to deliver pandemic response systems for the world. Okay, last question, Kevin. Good morning, given, hi. hi. Um, given the reliance on China when it comes to medical supplies mm -hmm. and that supply chain, which obviously those supplies are desperately needed in the U.S. right now, does the Trump administration have to wait until this health care crisis in the United States is over before you can actually talk about the specifics of inflicting a price on China 
as you have repeatedly uh, said this administration will do? Our first priority, unambiguously, is to address the crisis in which we find ourselves. As a direct result of this virus that came out of Wuhan, China, that's been the Vice President's task force focus. It's been our State Department's focus on both the, the side of doing our best to understand what happened there as well as getting the American people back. This is a moment. We've got to get it right. We've then got to get the economy cranked back up. There'll be ample time to evaluate um, how it is we hold accountable those responsible for the loss of what is now tens of thousands of American lives and enormous amount of wealth, not only American wealth, but glo the global economy's devastation as a result of this virus. There'll, there'll be a time for this. We'll get that timing right. And as President Trump said when he took office, uh, we're no longer going to tolerate a non-reciprocal behavior from the Chinese government. We saw it first in trade. We said we want it free, we want it uh, abundant, and we want it reciprocal. He drove towards that. He got a phase one trade deal. We were hopeful we could move out on the second part of that as well. And that will ultimately be the decision of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Are they prepared to engage in trade in a way that is fair and reciprocal? Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, I don't, overnight I saw comments from the Chinese foreign ministry talking about a coercive activity with respect to Australia, who had the temerity to ask for an investigation. Who in the world wouldn't want an investigation of how this happened to the world? Uh, I, I assume the people of China, they're good people. There are doctors, scientists there. Imagine if those scientists and doctors were working in our system, in a free system where you put hypothesis forward and it was challenged, but you had the freedom to talk and publish papers and others could comment. And uh, This is what democracies do best. The solution to this crisis will come from freedom-loving people around the world. I'm very confident of that. Authoritarian regimes are poorly designed to deal with the kind of crisis that this pandemic has engendered. Democracies, where we're free to critique and comment and you can ask the Secretary of State a hard question. Um, th these are the kinds of places where scientists and freedom and thought and journalists can all operate freely. These are the societies that will deliver the right outcome, will deliver the therapeutics, will deliver the vaccines, will get the right outcome to get our economies back going again. I'm highly confident of that. Uh, this is where we see the true benefit of freedom and liberty. And uh, in the days and weeks and months ahead, I am confident that the world will see that as well. Can I ask you Thanks, one everybody. About Thanks the for being labs. with me this morning. Have, everybody have a good day.